Hello, Biology 100 students. Uh, welcome to the first lecture uh, of Biology 100 from Columbia College. Uh, it's me, your instructor, Greg Doheny again. And uh, this is not really an academic lecture. It's simply uh, an introduction to the course and an introduction to biology itself as a, sip, uh, as a discipline. Uh, I will probably not ask you about anything that's on this this presentation, uh, but it's just a way of uh, basically a quick tour of the course so that you can see where we're going and also so that you can see wh what uh, biology as a profession and as a science is all about. Okay, so I an overview of the lecture. Usually when I begin a lecture, I give you uh, a small you know, indication of where we're going. And so where we're going today is, we're first going to ask what is biology? And biology uh, is sometimes considered to be part of what are called the life sciences, the sciences that study life itself. So in other words, the life sciences are all the sub-disciplines of biology. Biology is the most basic study of life and then there are a lot of specialty uh, professions within the subject of biology. Okay, so what are the sub-disciplines of biology? We, we will discuss that as well. Just in case any of you are interested in becoming biologists, or even if you're not interested in becoming biologists, it's to your advantage to know who the biologists are and what they do and, and how, much they, how much they know and how much they don't know. Uh, we'll finish off by having a very brief introduction to the scientific method. So what is a science? Well, a science, uh, I once I, I once had a cranky old professor who who uh, used to say why is it that everything that's a science doesn't call itself a science and everything that's not a science calls itself a science he said so physics that's a science it doesn't call itself a science but it's physics and then computer science is not a science it but but they do call themselves computer scientists now why is that and he would always go on this silly rant uh, but in a way what he was saying was correct because science the word science refers to a method. It simply refers to a method of finding out how the universe works. Uh, and it's that method of finding out how the universe works involves doing experiments and making observations. Uh, before we invented science as a discipline or as a method, uh, we used to figure out how things work using intuition and using observation. But science, in order, uh, in order to be a science, you have to be able to do experiments. A, sub, uh, a subject has to be able to do experiments. Uh, so you, 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 you do experiments, you, you come up with theories that we call hypotheses, and then you do experiments and you get results from the experiments, and then you reach conclusions from those results. And then you can then you have to present what you've discovered to the rest of the world. That's which is something called the peer review process, and uh, so that's science. Science is not a it's a it's a meth it's simply a meth <coughs> excuse me it's simply a method of finding out how the universe works, and it's been a very successful successful method because the human human race has advanced incredibly fast since we started using science to figure out how the universe works as opposed to uh, following whichever people can make the most convincing argument about how the universe works we say I, I don't care about your opinions show me the data show me some data show me the experimental evidence that proves the point you're trying to make I don't, I don't care how eloquent a speaker you are I don't care how 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 charismatic and convincing you are show me the data show me the results of your experiments and I, I will repeat your experiments and then we'll see if they're true or not. Okay, so that's the, that's the scientific method, which is very important to all the sciences, not just biology. Okay, and then at the very end of this slideshow, I will give you an introduction, a summary of where the course is going, what we're going to be learning about every week. All right, so to start off with biology, the word biology is a combination from a, an ancient Greek word meaning life, the ancient Greek word bios means life, and the ancient ancient Latin word, which was spoken by the ancient Romans that lived in Italy, a Latin word logi, which means to study. So bio, life, logi, the study of life. Uh, biology, you'll find that biology, as we go through this, biology contains a lot of Greek and Latin words. And this is, by the way, this is not modern Greek. Uh, we used to have a, a Greek instructor at Columbia College, and I used to 
ask him these words and see if he knew what they meant and he didn't he'd say although those are ancient greek words we don't speak that variation of greek anymore and latin of course is not spoken anymore because there are no more romans the only people who speak latin are the, are the the uh, practitioners in the catholic church theoretically if you're a catholic a Catholic Christian priest is supposed to know how to speak Latin. They all go to school to learn to speak Latin because that was the original language of Christianity uh, in, in, in Rome anyway. So the last people on earth who speak, who speak uh, Latin are not, not Romans, they are Catholics. Uh, so anyway, but you will find that in this course we learn to use a lot of Greek and Latin. We will learn a lot of Greek and Latin words. It's just the nature of the science. Uh, biology, um, the reason for that is you'll notice that for every science uh, or every, every academic discipline, it will incorporate words, a jargon if you will, it'll, it'll incorporate words that were, uh, that were added to that, to that discipline by the people who who excelled with it or who originated it um, and and whatever language and culture they had so for example you know for example er, uh, uh, you know algebra was invented by Arabs and and or by Arabs and Persians and so there are Arab and Persian words in arithmetic and then uh, chemistry had its heyday had its most uh, significant advances at that with the, under the under the study of germans in the 19th century and so you see that chemistry has a lot of german words incorporated into it so for it's, for instance the aufbau principle of chemistry refers to reorganization of electrons and aufbau in german is the word for reconstructing or rebuilding things and so why do we have german words in chemistry because when when chemistry chemistry became a very successful science at the hands of Germans and so they put their own words in there. Uh, now what about biology, what about computer science, right? Computer science has a whole bunch of American words in it because because that as a science, computer science was invented or, or you know brought to its heyday by Americans and so therefore you have American slang words in there like crash, computer crash, reboot, those are American slang words. Okay, so cut and paste, copy paste, or those are American slang words. So how did biology get all these Greek and Latin words in it? Well, that's because biology as a science reached its heyday, reached its most critical points. It, it matured as a science in the 16th and 17th centuries, 15th, 16th, 17th centuries. And in the 15th and 16th and 17th centuries, all of the intellectuals in the world were expected to speak Latin and Greek. Uh, we don't you know, anyone who went to a university was often, uh, if you were, regardless of whether you were in England or whether you were in France or whether you were in Germany, you went to university, you were probably educated in Latin uh, and you and you learned to speak Latin and Greek. And so that it was meant to be the mark of, a, of an educated person was the ability to speak Latin and Greek. And so as a result of that, in, this is true in the in the 17th century, in the 18th century, the mark of an educated person was being able to speak Latin and Greek. And so biology became a very important science during that time. And so there are, they incorporated a lot of Latin and Greek words. And we still do. People still put, uh, still put Latin words into things without being aware of it. Um, uh, but you, you'll find as you go through this course that a lot of the words that you've been using in everyday in everyday English conversation are actually Latin words or words that have a Latin origin. So we'll go through that as we go along. Um, certainly that's true. If any of you take my Biology 130 course, almost all of the words that describe the parts of the human body are Latin words. So the anatomy course that we teach, you learn a, you learn a lot of Latin words. Uh, you learn a lot of Latin words. Okay, so biology, Biology is the study of life, and this is actually quite ironic because everything in the laboratory that, that you use to study biology is usually dead. We dissect dead animals in the laboratory, we look at dead insects, we look at dead bacteria under the microscope. So it's ironic that, that people who study life are usually looking at dead things. But anyway, that's, that's what it is. All right, now, these are all the subtopics that we're gonna go through in this course briefly. And you'll notice that usually when I give a lecture, when I give a slide presentation, I talk about something in this screen over here, and then I have a list of points over here on the other side that, that indicates sort of where we are in the, in the talk. So I'm gonna go through the talk, and you can follow along this list from top to bottom. 
Okay, so I should mention that uh, we will discuss a little bit of chemistry in this course. Chemistry is the study of atoms and molecules. If you put together atoms and molecules, you get something called macromolecules. Macromolecule, the word macro is a Latin word meaning large. So macromolecules simply means large molecules. And, and if you put together certain types of macromolecules, that is the subject, that subject is called biochemistry because it's the chemistry of biological things. It's the chemistry of biological systems, that's biochemistry. And then we'll talk about the difference between atoms versus molecules and molecules versus macromolecules. Now, any of those things, if you study chemistry, biochemistry, or molecules, you're not technically a biologist. A biologist is studying things that are alive, and the smallest living thing is a cell. Right? So the subject of this slide is we're talking about cells. So the cell is the smallest unit of life. If you study things that are smaller than a cell, you're not a biologist, you're a chemist or a biochemist. If you study things that are the size of a cell or larger, you're a biologist. Now, uh, anything smaller than, well, a bi and then in addition to that, biologists uh, divide themselves into two very important subgroups. Regular biologists study things that are big enough to be seen without a microscope things that are big enough to be seen with the naked eye. If whatever you're studying is small enough that you need a microscope to see it, you are, of course, a microbiologist. Right? So microbiologists study life forms that are small enough that you need a microscope to see them. You cannot see them with just the unaided eye. Right? So biologists study things that are big enough to see without a microscope. Here we have a tiger, of course. Microbiologists use microscopes to look at things that are smaller than that. So does anyone know what this is? This is a trypanosome. These, these things, this is a sample of human blood. These are red blood cells that are carrying oxygen around the body. And this is a parasite called a trypanosome, which uh, uh, you can get if you're in the tropics and you're bitten by certain types of insects, you can get infected with trypanosomes and get something called sleeping sickness. And that's that. those organisms are small enough that you have to see them with a microscope. And so that would be a microbiologist who studies those things. All right, continuing with our list. All right, as I said, chemistry is the study of atoms and elements. We will discuss that in the next lecture, so don't worry about it too much here. And so ke chemistry, Basically, if you take every substance and you purify it, you can purify every substance in the earth down to its composite elements. The elements are things such as carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, and so on. We call those elements. And then if, and, and so there are things called carbon atoms, and there are things called hydrogen atoms, and there are things called oxygen atoms, and so on. If you put together, if you stick together various atoms of carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, for example, using something called chemical bonds, and we have three types of chemical bonds that we'll learn about in the next lecture. Those three types of bonds are called covalent bonds, ionic bonds, and hydrogen bonds. If you stick them together, you will produce molecules. Uh, now, sometimes building a bond consumes energy and sometimes breaking a chemical bond liberates energy and so we call those chemical reactions where bonds are broken or formed in order to put molecules together or to take molecules apart we call those chemical reactions and if energy is released during a certain chemical reaction we call that an exothermic reaction if energy is consumed, we call that an endothermal, endothermic reaction. Now, by the way, I'm sure you probably know what the prefix endo means. The word endo is a Latin word that means to go into. The word exo is another Latin word which means to come out of, right? So endother endothermic means you're consuming energy. Energy is going into the reaction in order to make the reaction proceed. If energy is liberated, comes out of the reaction, that's called an exothermic reaction because the temperature or the energy is coming out. Okay, now in biology, the, there, in every cell of the human body, there are millions and billions of chemical reactions that are going, along, going on simultaneously. And those chemical reactions are not random, they are very specific reactions. And those reactions are catalyzed, catalyzed by things called enzymes. 
Right, now, catalysis is a chemical term that means you have something that facilitates a reaction, something that makes a chemical reaction occur more easily. Right, that, that is, in, in chemical terms, that's generally called a catalyst. Now, if that catalyst is made out of biological materials, we call it an enzyme. So as we're going to learn later on, there is one of the one of the classes of things that make up the human body is called proteins. You've probably heard the word protein before. Well, protein is one of the four basic types of macromolecules that make up the human body. Right? So, so proteins is something we'll hear a lot about in the next two, two or three lectures. However, one of the functions of proteins is to catalyze chemical reactions that take place in the cells. And so these, these catalysts that catalyze chemical reactions inside human cells and animal cells and which are made of protein are called enzymes. So enzymes are biological catalysts that are made of biological macromolecules. And their purpose is to facilitate specific chemical reactions, specifically the chemical reactions that power and build and, and reorganize the human body. Okay, so back to chemistry again. You might have seen this at some time in your life, and I apologize, by the way, to any of you that have studied science and chemistry and so on. This is a, probably a very boring review for you, but for those of you who have never studied chemistry before, never, never, never had any interest in chemistry, we are going to have to have a very brief introduction to chemistry. So you might have seen this. This is called the periodic table of the elements. If you break every substance down in the world, every substance in the world can be broken down to a combination of these things that are called elements. Every element is symbolized with a one or two letters and something called an atomic number and so on. We're not going to use, not, not going to worry about that too much. But the element symbol for carbon is C. Right? The element symbol for oxygen is O. Uh, let's see here. The element symbol for sodium is Na, and the element symbol for Chlorine is Cl. If you react sodium and chlorine together, you get a familiar substance, which is called sodium chloride, which or also known as table salt that you put into your food. Okay, so table salt is a simple combination of sodium and chloride. If you break apart the salt, if you expose it to certain chemical reactions, you can actually purify chlorine and sodium. Sodium is a metal, by the way, so you you put together chlorine is normally a gas. You put together sodium metal chlorine gas, you carry out a certain chemical reaction and they end up forming table salt. You can reverse that by taking table salt apart and, and breaking it back down into sodium and chlorine. So that's chemical reactions of elements to forming molecules. All right, so we have atoms that have single letter codes. We've seen that. We're going to discuss that in the next lecture. Molecules are where you put together two or more atoms, right? So oxygen, uh, sorry, water, as I'm sure you know, is two, mole two atoms of hydrogen, hydrogen there, and one bound together with one molecule of oxygen, which is over here. And that forms a molecule, not an atom, but a molecule, not a molecule called H2O or water. Table salt is a molecule that's made of two atoms that are bound together by something called an ionic bond. And table sugar is something called sucrose. And sucrose is made of these atoms, atoms bound together in a single molecule. Right, so atoms, molecules, this is, this is what we deal with in order to make more complicated structures. Okay, how the atoms are arranged matters. We'll talk about this later on, but you don't have to worry about this yet. But on the left side here, I have something called alpha-D-glucose. Glucose is a sugar that you could eat, right? Uh, and a lot of things are made of glucose, but there are two specific types of glucose. And so one of them is called alpha-glucose, and one of them is called beta-glucose. Beta and alpha, by the way, are two letters from the Greek alphabet. So here we go with the Greek again. All right, so that's the, that is the symbol for alpha down here. And this, this is the symbol for the Greek letter beta. OK, now, can you spot the difference between these two molecules? Right, it may take you a minute to look if you want to look. Well, if you look, there is only one difference between the way these two molecules are arranged. On, on the alpha glucose, this hydrogen here is above the plane of the molecule. And on the other side, in beta-glucose, it's beneath it. Right? Now, that's a very small difference. But that very small difference makes a huge difference to the characteristics of these two molecules. And I'll show you why. 
alpha glucose we can eat potatoes one of the main constituents of potatoes is glucose alpha glucose right we can eat that we can digest it the reason for that is because we have enzymes in our stomach that are uh, enzymes actually in our intestine in our stomach that can break down glucose uh, a breakdown starch into alpha glucose and then we use glucose to power chemical reactions in the body okay but the other one beta glucose is the principal constituent of wood and you know that we can't digest wood and the reason for that is because we do not have any enzymes that can digest or break down or digest beta glucose now here you see Canada's national animal the Canadian animal is the beaver the beaver is cutting down a tree, but if you've ever, if you've never seen a beaver and if you don't know anything about them, you might have seen them on cartoons for entertainment, and they show beavers eating wood. And in fact, of course, we know that they're not really eating the wood, they're simply chewing on it to cut the tree down. So beavers cut down trees and they use it to build a house called a beaver lodge. Uh, so beavers, beavers, by the way, are the Canadian national animal. It's not a very dignified animal. You know, we don't have an eagle like the United States or a bear like the Russians. We have a we have a beaver. Okay, so wood is made primarily of beta glucose, and there are very few forms of life that can digest or eat beta glucose. There are lots of forms of life, including humans, that can eat alpha glucose. Okay, so the structure of the way the the way the atoms are arranged within the molecule are critical. So if you look at every atom that's in alpha glucose, the same atoms are in beta glucose. So the same atoms are there, but it, they have these two molecules have very different properties depending on how those atoms are arranged. As I said, there are very few organisms on Earth that can actually eat cellulose. One of them happens to be fungi. So this is here we have mushrooms or what's known as shelf fungi growing out of a tree because fungi have enzymes that are able to break down and eat uh, uh, beta glucose. So if you put together a chain of beta glucose, you get something called cellulose. Cellulose is the principal constituent of wood. It's the principal component of wood. There are very few organisms on Earth that can digest and eat cellulose, but fungi are one of them. All right, so chemical bonds, we said that molecules are made of atoms that are put together by bonds. We have three types of bonds, as I mentioned before. We have covalent bonds, which are the strongest. We have ionic bonds, which are weaker, and we have hydrogen bonds, which are sometimes known as London forces. Uh, or sorry, sorry hydro, I'm, I apologize. Hydrogen bonds are not known as London forces. Hydrogen bonds are the weakest bonds, and then you also have very weak bonds that are available called London forces, also known as Van der Waal forces. So there are basically three types of chemical bonds that we worry about covalent bonds, ionic bonds, and hydrogen bonds. We're not going to dwell too much on chemistry. In fact, by week two, you're not you're not going to be worried about chemistry at all. It'll it'll it will all be over with by week three at the latest. Okay, so these bonds are caused when you, when, when uh, covalent bonds, for instance, are caused when two atoms share an electron. So remember that atoms are composed of three different, what are called subatomic particles. They're in the nucleus, the central part of the atom, we have neutrons and protons. And then away from the nucleus, we have electrons. If you have two atoms that share a pair of electrons, for instance, that forms something called a covalent bond. Uh, the ionic bonds and the hydrogen bonds are caused by attractions rather than very heavy bonds. Okay, so if two atoms or two or more atoms share pairs of electrons, it's called a covalent bond. So here we have a covalent bond between, here's a hydrogen with an unpaired electron. Here, uh, sorry, that's an, uh, here's, a, here's another hydrogen with an unpaired electron, right? And then here's an oxygen that has two unpaired electrons. The, the trick of learning about co covalent bonds is just learning that they don't like to, atoms don't like to have unpaired electrons. So they will sometimes share a pair of electrons, right? So here we have this hydrogen sharing the oxygen electron and this other is sharing the oxygen electron as well. And so we have a molecule here. And of course, you'll probably recognize that as water. 
Okay, so covalent bond is simply when two atoms are bound together and share a, a pair of electrons. These are the strongest type of bonds. We'll talk about that in more detail in the next lecture. And ionic bonds is where one atom is not content to share the other atom's electron. It actually has to steal it completely. And if, 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 if you steal an electron away from another atom, you'll actually develop a negative charge. And the atom that, that you stole the electron from will have a, a net positive charge. And so you will stick together by the positive negative attraction. So positive charges are attracted to negative charges. If I'm an atom and I steal an electron from another atom, I will have a neg negative charge because I have one too many atoms. And the one that I stole it from will have a positive charge and then we'll actually be attracted together and stuck together by attraction of forces, right? So we'll talk about that later. It's not a big deal for today. All right, so there are other ways of, of, of illustrating molecules, a shorthand way of listing all the, all the uh, atoms that are present in a molecule. This is called the formula, the chemical formula for a molecule, but that just, that just tells you which atoms are there. You can see here that we have three carbon atoms and eight hydrogen atoms, but it's how they are arranged that gives them their characteristics or properties to these molecules. So this is a this is a, another type of diagram that's commonly used by people who study chemistry of organic compounds, organic chemists. And so this is this indicates that the way that the way the three carbons and the eight hydrogens are arranged is like this. And if there was another type of arrangement, this molecule would have other, other physical and chemical properties. Okay, so as we said, often when you break covalent bonds, they release energy. And so this is propane. You've seen what happens when propane catches fire. You have a critical reaction and, and all of the propane starts, basically the propane reacts with, uh, reacts with water in the atmosphere and oxygen and burns basically so burning is what happens when you mix when, when you oxidize uh, a molecule like this and a lot of energy is released so this is obviously an endothermic reaction on the left all right so if you want to get away with learning as little chemistry as possible you could simply memorize that the the most important elements for biologists are carbon nitrogen oxygen hydrogen and a little bit of sulfur and a little bit of, you know, a little bit of sulfur here and there, a couple, a little bit of magnesium and iron and manganese, those are metals. But the main things, by far the most, the, the most important elements for biology are carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, and hydrogen. And you can simply memorize the fact that carbon forms four covalent bonds with other molecules. Nitrogen forms three, oxygen forms two, and hydrogen forms one. So you can quiz yourself right now. You can say, if you react hydrogen with nitrogen, how many, how many hydrogens will nitrogen react with to form a molecule? Right. Okay, you can see that nitrogen has forms three covalent bonds and hydrogen only forms one. So therefore, nitrogen easily reacts with three hydrogen atoms to form NH3, which is ammonia. Right, so ammonia. Uh, ammonia is a very common compound in biology, and so uh, we'll talk about ammonia later on. Okay, so here we have our propane. Right here we have some other arrangements. Uh, the, the, the properties of these molecules will be dif different depending on whether they have single bonds, double bonds, triple bonds, and so on. So we say that carbon can form four bonds. But there's no rule that says the carbon has to form bonds with only other carbons. They can form bonds with nitrogens or oxygens or hydrogens. So if, if you have a molecule that's made entirely of carbons and hydrogens, naturally we call that a hydrocarbon. A hydrocarbon is just a molecule made entirely of carbons and hydrogens, usually in one of these kind of configurations. And we said that carbon forms four bonds. But that doesn't mean if, let's say, carbon is reacting and forming a bond with another carbon, there's no rule that says that it can only react, it can only share one pair of electrons with another carbon. It could possibly share two pairs of electrons with another carbon, and we call that a double bond. It could possibly form three carbon, uh, three bonds, with, share three pairs of electrons, and therefore form three bonds with another carbon. And that's called a triple bond, right? So if you have a molecule like this, this is ethane. All, uh, sorry, it's an alkane. <clears throat> this is an alkane. 
If you have a double bond present, it's an alkene. I'm not going to ask you about this on a test, by the way. I promise I will not. And if it has a triple bond, it's an alkyne. So that's just telling you what the, you know, the, the name actually tells you how many bonds are present between carbons in those molecules. Okay, so we will discuss that more in the next lecture, but we're not going to, we're not going to become fanatic chemists. Okay, as I said, ionic bonds are just electrical attractions between molecules when one, when electron is stolen completely from the other. Okay, so here we have sodium and, uh, sodium and chloride. Notice that the chloride over here has completely stolen this atom from the sodium. And so the chlorine picks up a net negative charge. The sodium then has a net positive charge because it has one more proton in its nucleus than it should have. And these two end up being attracted to each other by electrical forces. Okay, hydrogen bonds are where one, one atom pulls an electron from another atom. It pulls it to itself very closely, but it doesn't completely steal it. But because it's closer to me than the atom that I pulled it from, the atom that I'm pulling it from picks up a partial positive charge. And then I pick up a partial negative charge. And therefore, my partial negative charge will attract other molecules that are partially positively charged. So those bonds tend to be fairly weak, and we call them hydrogen bonds because one of the most common, uh, one of the most common uh, atoms to have its electron stolen is usually the hydrogen. All right, so here these are these are hydrogen bonds uh, between uh, the the oxygen tends to pull the electron closer to itself, and therefore the this hyd the, the oxygen tends to pull the electrons closer to itself, giving it sort of a a net negative charge, and then the uh, partial positive charge is held by the hydrogens, so that these hydrogens have a partial positive charge now, and the oxygen has a partial negative charge. Right? So they can attract other water molecules. This is a water molecule. They can attract other water molecules that also have partial charges. All right, so here we have oxygen, and oxygen is what we call a polar molecule because we said that the oxygen has a partial negative charge, and it's kind of arranged like this so that the positive part of a water molecule is over here. And then over here on the other side, polarized means on opposite sides. You know, poles are opposite sides of an object. So over here we have the hydrogens that are polarizing the, polarizing the uh, you know, the partial negative, a partial positive charge over there. All right, so this is the DNA double helix, which we'll be talking about later in the course, and it is held together on the inside entirely by hydrogen bonds. If it was held together by some other type of bonds, it, it probably wouldn't be possible to encode our genetic information. So we'll talk about how that works later. All right, so biochemistry is our chemists that are specialists who specialize in the chemical reactions that take place in living things, such as humans, right? They, so they specialize in studying the chemistry of human life. They study enzyme catalysis. They only deal with solutions. You know, a solution is what you get when you pour a solid, you mix, you dissolve a solid into a liquid. The word dissolve has the word sol at the end. Sol comes from the word solution, right? So when you dissolve something, you take when you dissolve a powder or something, you put if you put salt powder into water, it will dissolve, and it will form a salt solution. So if you if you so as it happens, the the powder that you put into the liquid is called the solute, and then the liquid that you dissolve the solute in is called the solvent the solvent and there are many different types of solvents you can dissolve some powders in alcohols and you can dissolve some powders in other things but if you dissolve anything in water that we we have a special name for that and it is called an aqueous solution the word aqueous another latin word means water aqueous so water aqua uh, an aqueous solution is a is a solution where you dissolve something in water and so all of the chemistry of life is, is involved with, with uh, aqueous solutions, uh, chemical reactions that take place in aqueous solutions.
Right. Now, acids and bases, we will need to learn a little bit about that. Acids basically are sour to the touch and they're, they can be reactive if they're concentrated enough. Bases are bitter to the taste. You know, So vinegar, for instance, is, is an acid. It's a very weak acid. That's why if you put vinegar on your food, uh, and you eat the food, it, you know, you put vinegar on the salad, it doesn't burn your tongue or anything, it just tastes a little bit sour. If the vinegar was very concentrated, it would burn your tongue, but it's a dilute solution. A dilute solution means it's not very concentrated. If it was a concentrated solution of acetic acid, it would burn your tongue, right? So vinegar is acetic acid. Uh, an example of a base, if you get an upset stomach, you take these little pills called Tums, uh, or you take bicarbonate of soda, that's a base. And a base is something that can neutralize an acid. So usually you had a stomach ache because your stomach was making too much acid. And so you took a base to counter the, counter the reaction. Now we measure how acidic things are, how strong an acid is, or how, how strong a base is using something called the pH scale. Right? And we will talk about that later. But a low number, a low pH number means something is acidic. A high pH number means that it is basic. For example, in the stomach, we have hydrochloric acid, which is very acidic, and hydrochloric acid helps to break down our food. That's why when you vomit, you get a sore throat because at literally acid, hydrochloric acid, uh, boiled up from your stomach and splashed into your esophagus where it can feel pain. Right? So you literally burned your esophagus, you know, your food, the, the, the pipe that takes food from your mouth to the stomach is called the esophagus. You literally burned it with an acid. Okay, so uh, in our stomachs, we have a, there is a low pH environment. The pH in the stomach is about pH 2 because hydrochloric acid is, hydrochloric acid is, uh, is in the stomach. In the human intestine, where the food the food goes when it leaves when the, when food leaves the human stomach, it goes into the intestine. The intestine is a basic environment or an alkaline environment. Alkaline means basic, and it has a very high pH. It has a pH of about eight or seven point five. Right. So, so the stomach is an acidic environment. It has a low pH. The intest the human intestine is a is an alkaline environment. It has a high pH. Now you can add, if you have a solution and you add an acid to it, the pH will go down. If you add a base to it, the pH will go up. What if you want to resist that? If you resist that, if you want to avoid uh, having the pH of a solution change with the addition of acid or base, you can add a chemical called a buffer. So the word buffer is kind of, means basically a cushion. Right? It's a cushion that prevents radical changes. So if you add a buffer to a solution, you're buffering the solution. You, you would have to add a lot of acid before the pH would start to go down. So there are many buffers in human biology. The human blood is buffered by uh, something called carbon dioxide and carbonic acid. We'll, we will learn a little bit about that. And the human blood is also buffered to pH 7.2 or 7.4 on the pH scale. It is buffered to a, to a pH of about 7.2 by a phosphate buffer in the blood. So we will talk a little bit about that, but again, that's biochemistry, not biology. So we're not gonna, we're not gonna dwell on that. We're not gonna spend too much time on that. Okay, so acids and bases. Okay, so as I said, these are two acids that you might recognize. Vinegar that you put on your salad is a, is a weak acid, and lemon juice is a weak acid. So, so vinegar is an acid called acetic acid, and lemon juice is an acid called citric acid. And you find the same citric acid in other, uh, in other citrus fruits, which is where they get, they get their name. A base, typical example of a base is this Tums, this stuff you take for an upset stomach. It has, these pills have a very high pH. So if your stomach is producing too much acid, then this will help to bring the pH up. So as I said, the stomach has a pH of about two because it contains hydrochloric acid. And the intestine has a pH of around 7.5 or eight because it contains bicarbonate. Bicarbonate is a base, a chemical that's a base. Right, so stomach pH two, intestine pH eight. I often ask that question on quizzes. Right, I ask you what the pH of the stomach versus the intestine is. That's a common question for quizzes. 
All right, so what are macromolecules? The word macro is a Latin word for very big, so very large molecules. And there, are, and then if you put together these macromolecules, there are actually four classes of macromolecules that make up the human body. Lipids, which are commonly known, known as fats or oils. Proteins, I just explained that, that uh, enzymes are made of protein, but so are, so are hair and fingernails and a lot of other structures in the body are made of proteins. Carbohydrates are commonly called sugars. Uh, so there are, a lot of, there are a lot of sugars in the body. The, the word sugar I don't like because it, it suggests that these are sweet. In fact, most carbohydrates are not sweet. So for example, I mentioned the fact that potatoes are made mostly out of alpha glucose that's put together into chains. If you put together chains of alpha glucose, you make something called starch. And as you probably know, potatoes are a, a rich source of starch, and so is rice. And if you and and the starch is classified as a carbohydrate, but it's certainly not sweet. You, you know, potatoes are not sweet, rice is not sweet, so not all carbohydrates are sweet. In fact, very few of them are. Finally, the fourth class of macromolecules are called the nucleic acids. That's just basically the DNA and the RNA. Uh, we'll talk about that later. Okay, so as I said, lipids, one of the four classes of macromolecules, they tend to be hydrophobic, which means insoluble. They do not dissolve in water very well. And they, uh, fats and oils are examples of lipids. There are both in the human body. Butter is made of uh, a lipid that's uh, created from uh, extraction from fat. And in the human body, we store spare energy in the form of lipids uh, where you have cells that are filled with fats and we call cells that are filled with fats adipose tissue. So in modern society, in you know humans we believe humans evolved from hunter-gatherer societies where we didn't have a we didn't have a steady food supply and so we used to need to build up reserve energy supplies in our body we did that in the form of fats so if you were a caveman 200,000 years ago and you ate a big you you killed a you killed a uh, saber-toothed tiger or something like that you killed a mammoth and then you ate it if you ate a lot of it ideally you would gain some fat because you need to store the energy because you never know when you're going to run across another mastodon. So it was an advantage for the body to be able to store fat. Right? Now, uh, today, for some reason, after in, you know, the difference between now and, and 200,000 years ago when we were living as hunter-gatherers is practically nothing as far as nature is concerned, suddenly overnight it appears that we no longer like the appearance of fat on the body or something. So we do everything we can to get rid of it. But in fact, fat is a for all of human evolution has been a good thing because if you can build fat quickly, you eat a little bit of food, the, the little bit of food you eat goes into direct energy and anything that's not used is automatically converted into fat reserves. That was a good thing. Suddenly overnight we decided it was unsightly, but you know it is, a good, it is actually a good thing to have a, a me metabolism in the human body that can store fat. Okay, so uh, those are lipids, fats, oils, ad and adipose tissue. Right, so here we have butter. Uh, butter is a lipid oil, vegetable oil or other oils are lipids. So are waxes. Waxes are also fats. So beeswax is an example of a lipid. So beeswax, a lipid, it's a wax. And then butter, a lipid, oils are lipids. Okay, adipose tissue is used for mammals primarily for insulation. So it's it, fat is used for uh, energy reserve and also to keep the heat inside your body. Uh, there are other animals that don't, so you know, mammals, uh, I'll talk about what mammals are in a minute, but mammals are unique in that they pack the fat in the body on the outside, on the outer surface of the body, right? Now that, that's an advantage because it also keeps the heat in if you're able to use fat for insulation, that means that you can live in colder climates, which other animals cannot do, right? So fish, a lot of types of fish don't store fat, so they can only, they're only, you know, they can't live in northern oceans. There are many types of fish that can't live in northern oceans because they don't have adipose tissue on the outside of the body. They do have it on the inside. Uh, another perfect example are the amphibians and, and reptiles and things, they store the fat in the in the body near the organs 
but not on the outside and so therefore they can't really insulate themselves they can't stand a low temperature uh, so humans and other mammals ha store the adipose tissue around the outside which allows them to keep in the heat and live in colder climates and that explains why humans can live in such cold climates including Canada where very few animals can live you know there are lots of if you if you go to the tropics where it's very warm you find millions and millions of different types of animals that you don't find in Canada in Canada you only find the types of animals that have fat insulation who can live in the northern climates, including the humans, of course. Okay, proteins are made of different combinations of 20 different macromolecules called amino acids. We will talk about those later. Uh, each of the 20 different amino acids has different chemical properties. If you put together a series of these amino acids, depending on which amino acids you put together and what order you put them together in, they will have different properties as well. Okay, so for example, Right, so hair, as I said, hair is a protein. Hair is very different from muscle, but muscle is another protein. So hair is made of one set of amino acids. Muscle is made of another combination of amino acids. Hair and fingernails are made of the same uh, protein called, uh, called keratin. We'll talk about that later. All right, so hemoglobin is the protein that is carried by red blood cells that carries oxygen around in the blood. So that's another example of a protein. Okay, carbohydrates, commonly called sugars, sometimes called saccharides, so carbohydrates. Carbohydrates tend to be long chains of hydrocarbons with a hydroxyl group, one or more hydroxyl groups at the end. And when we get to the chemistry section, we'll tell you what a hydroxyl group is. Right? And then if you, have one, if you have one of these carbohydrates put together, you have something called a monosaccharide. If you put together two carbohydrates, you have a disaccharide. If you put together a long chain of carbohydrates, you have something called a polysaccharide. So we will discuss what monosaccharides, disaccharides, and polysaccharides are when we get to the macromolecules lecture. Okay, so here are the sugars. As I said, cellulose is the main constituent of wood. It's a carbohydrate. Starch is the main constituents, uh, constituent of potatoes and rice. It's also a carbohydrate. Sucrose, commonly known as table sugar, is also a carbohydrate which happens to be sweet to the to the taste and i often ask you what is the on a quiz on a quiz i may often ask you the question what is the name of the carbohydrate that we commonly call table sugar that we commonly use for table sugar and the answer is sucrose sucrose and so we'll talk about that later when we have the macromolecule lecture okay so here are the different the, the way the carb, carbons and hydrogens are arranged is important Okay, nucleic acids, we're talking about DNA and RNA that is found in the center of cells, genetic information. Right? Okay, so this is what they look like. We'll talk about them in more detail later. Okay, so this is deoxyribose and this is ribose. We'll be talking about this again later, but notice that here we have an oxygen and a hydrogen together. And the only thing that's different between this molecule and this molecule is that the oxygen is missing here, right? So over here, this is ribose, and this is deoxyribose because the oxygen is gone, right? So that's what DNA is made of, and this is what RNA is made of. We'll talk about those two things later. Okay, so DNA, this is a double helix, what's known as a double helix, which contains all the genetic information that's used to build the human body or any other animal body. Okay, now let's look at, let's return to the idea of, you know, enough of that nonsense with the chemistry. Let's talk about biology again. Okay, so what is the difference between biology and microbiology one more time? Okay, so biologists study life forms that are large enough to be seen without a microscope. Microbiologists, smaller things. Okay, microbiologists study smaller things, but if it's a, if you put together a lot of cells and make a larger creature, then you're a regular biologist again. So these are animal cells, by the way, and these are plant cells. Right? We'll talk about the difference later on. Now, that, now within the cell, you know that the human body is composed of organs. For example, the heart, the liver, the kidneys, those are all organs. And as it happens, cells, on the inside of cells, you find microscopic organs. And so there are little structures inside cells that carry out specific functions the way organs do on the larger human body. 
And so we call those things organelles, and we will talk about them later. So this is the nucleus. This is where the DNA is stored. And the nucleus of a cell is an organelle. That's one of the organelles. Okay, so we'll talk about the cells and the organelles in another lecture. Okay, there's the nucleus. Okay, later on we will talk about the difference between the two main types of life on Earth. We have two basic types of life on Earth. One type is called prokaryotes. The other type are the eukaryotes. The prokaryotes are individual cells. You do not have multicellular prokaryotes, right? So humans are multicellular organisms because we're made of billions of cells. Whereas prokaryotes are unicellular organisms because they're made of only one cell. So the word unicellular means that it's a, it's a complete organism that is made of only one cell. And in the case of a prokaryote, that cell happens to be very small, right? So if it's a small cell and it happens to have no nucleus, Right, so the main main distinguishing feature between, well, let me say that there are three distinguishing features between prokaryotes and eukaryotes. Number one, prokaryotes do not have a nucleus while eukaryotes do have a nucleus. So eukaryotes keep their genetic material in a nucleus. Right, now, prokaryotes are very small. Eukaryotes are larger. Right. And then often uh, prokaryotes have uh, what's uh, eukaryotes have something called an endomembrane system. Endomembrane system means um, uh, 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 membranes inside the cell itself, and we'll talk about that later. But for now, if I on a quiz, I might ask you name two differences between prokaryotes and eukaryotes. And the two differences are that prokary prokaryotes do not have a nucleus while eukaryotes do, and prokaryotes tend to be much smaller than eukaryotes, maybe only one-tenth the size. Right, so here we see two what are called buccal cells. These cells come from the, the cheek, the inner cheek of a human being. And this is the nucleus of the buccal cell. And these things here are bacterial cells or prokaryotes. Right, so the common name for prokaryotes is bacteria. Common name, bacteria. Okay, so here, here are some diagrams. The, this is a eukaryotic animal cell. This is a eukaryotic plant cell. And this is a prokaryote. But these drawings are not to scale. Generally, a plant cell is about two or three times bigger than, a, than an animal cell. And an animal cell is about a thousand times bigger than a prokaryotic cell. So these drawings are not to scale. All right, let's talk about scale for a minute. How do we measure the scale of cells? Common, common theme in biology is what, what units of measurement do we use? Well, of course, we use the metric system. Now, the basic unit of size for the metric system is a meter, right? Now, if you take a meter and you divide it by a million, this is a mistake, that should say a million, but if you take a meter and you divide it by one million, you get 0 0.000000 meters or one one millionth of a meter, right? So you divide a meter into a million parts. What you have is something called a micrometer, abbreviated like this, commonly called a micron, right? So cell biologists are always talking about how many microns was that cell? How many microns is the nucleus? Oh, the nucleus is five microns in diameter. The cell is 10 microns in diameter and so on, right? So the common, the most common, uh, you should know, you should learn that the most common unit of measurement for cells is either a micron or a, a micrometer, commonly called a micron, or a nanometer. Okay, so if you take a meter and you divide it by a million, you have a micrometer or a micron. If you take a meter and you divide it by a billion, you have a nanometer, right? So when we talk about the things that we find in cells, the cells, generally the size of the complete cell is measured in microns or discussed in microns, and generally the organelles within the cell are discussed in terms of nanometers, right? So typically a nucleus is five micro, a typical human cell is 10 microns in diameter, I might even ask that on a quiz, a 10 micron diameter cell. The nucleus of a human cell is around three microns. It varies a little bit. And then if you look at a small organelle in the cell called a ribosome, a typical ribosome is five nanometers, right? So uh, a typical virus, viruses, by the way, are very, very small. And so viruses tend to be anywhere from five nanometers to 
500 nanometers, right? So if Columbia College, the building Columbia College was a cell, the second floor with the office would be the nucleus and a virus would be the size of a basketball, for instance, right? So, the, so that, those are the type of scale that you get for cells. And we will talk about that in greater detail later. All right, what are protists and multicellular organisms? Okay, so a protist is a unicellular eukaryote. And if you think about that for a minute, you can figure out what that means. I said that most eukaryotes are multicellular. So humans are classified as multicellular eukaryotic organisms because we are made of many cells, not just one cell, the way a prokaryote is. So we're made of many cells, we are multicellular, and the cells that we are made up of have a nucleus, and so we are eukaryotes right now. There are some organisms on Earth, in fact, a lot of them, that are eukaryotes, meaning they have a nucleus, but there's only one cell, and that constitutes the whole organism. That's the whole thing. And we call those protists, or sometimes protozoa. Protozoa means mobile protists, where, you know, the protists that can move around or swim around or crawl around. And protist is the term we use to describe uh, unicellular eukaryotes that are either mobile or not mobile. Right. So the, the technical term for being mobile in biology is motile, M-O-T-I-L-E, motile. Okay, so a protist is a unicellular eukaryote. We're not really going to be dealing with that in this course, except to discuss the fact that humans suffer from diseases, and some of those diseases are caused by protists, like that picture of the trypanosome that I showed you earlier. A trypanosome is a protist. If you get bitten by something called a, a tsetse fly, if you're in, in, in the Central Africa, you're bitten by a tsetse fly that carries Trypanosoma brucei. It's a protozoa that causes sleeping sickness and ultimately death. Okay, so multicellular organisms, humans are an example of multicellular organisms. Okay, so these are all protists. We have a trypanosome. This is another one called a giardia. This is one called a paramecium that swims around in the fresh water. These are all microscopic, so they would all be studied by microbiologists. This is a multicellular worm called a C. elegans worm, but it's still microscopic. Okay, so here we have all these all of these things except for the except for the flower here. These are all classified as animals technically. Uh, the tiger is an animal. The humans are animals. The butterfly is an animal. Believe it or not, insects are classified as animals. So is the bee. Now here we have sea sponges that live on the ocean. Those are actually classified as animals, believe it or not. Okay, so uh, seaweed is not an animal. It's a photosynthetic classified as a plant, but, but sea sponges are classified as animals. The reason for that is because they're not photosynthetic uh, and they, uh, they have to eat other organisms to survive. All right, so these are all animals. These are mammals. I mentioned the fact uh, I mentioned mammals before, and I promised to give you an explanation. Okay, so the explanation is a little bit crude, but it's accurate. Mammals are animals that feed animals. Uh, mammals are animals that feed their young milk, and milk is produced by mammary tissue mammary glands. So mammals are animals that have mammary glands, the females do anyway. When we have humans, the mammary glands are referred to as the breasts, right? So human, human females feed their young milk from the mammary glands. So do tigers, so do dolphins and whales, so do uh, uh, walruses that I showed you before. So mammals uh, are the group of mammals are this group of animals. And all mammals have, very, have a very common biology. Right? So you may not think that you have much in common with a tiger, but you have all of the same organs. So a tiger has two lungs, one, uh, two lungs, one liver, two kidneys. It has something called bilateral symmetry, meaning the left side and the right side are the same. It has two eyes, it has an esophagus, it has a trachea. The outside is built slightly differently, but you know, you can see that a tiger is very, you know, we don't really think of it this way, but a tiger is, is almost identical to a human and vice versa as far as nature is concerned. Whereas there are other animals that are very different, like the insects, for instance. Those, those are different than mammals and uh, other things are different than mammals, worms and so on, right? So mammals, we are, 
and so in fact in this course what I'm going to do is I'm going to teach you mainly about human biology but for comparative purposes for comparative purposes and for learning purposes I am going to mention occasionally other animals how other animal how the biology of other animals different differs from humans but bear in mind that the biology of mammals does not other mammals does not differ greatly from that of humans okay now these the, these two mammals are also vertebrates in fact, all mammals are vertebrates. And I'm sure you know that vertebrates means that they have a spinal cord. They have a backbone uh, because the, the backbone is part of the skeleton that is, and the backbone is composed of little units called vertebrae. Okay, now histology, remember there's that word logi again. Right? The word histology refers to the study of tissues, right? So if you put together a bunch of cells that all have the same function, you form something called a tissue. Right, so multicellular organi organisms have layers of specialized tissues, and those special the study of those specialized tissues is a science called histology, which is a branch. It's a subdiscipline of biology, and organs are made of specialized tissues. So the liver is made of specialized tissues, the kidneys are made of specialized tissues, and so on. <clears throat> now, if you take all of the organs that carry out a certain specific function, you have something called an organ system. And that is the that is the the cornerstone of this course. We are going to learn about the human organ systems. Right? So it, that is something called the study of human beings by learning about the organ systems is something called systems biology. So, for instance, the digestive system consists of the mouth, the salivary glands, the esophagus, the stomach, and the intestines. The respiratory system consists of the mouth and the nose, which is called the nasopharynx, the trachea, and two lungs. Those independent or organs are all involved in the same system because they're all involved in breathing. Just as all of the organs that I mentioned in the digestive system, they are all involved in the process of digesting food. And we have the nervous system, we have the respiratory system, we have the digestive system, we have the circulatory system. Circulatory system includes the heart, the, blood, the veins, the blood vessels, which are the veins, the arteries, uh, and the capillaries, right? That's called the circulatory system, whose job it is to transport oxygen and other things around the body using the blood. Okay, so most of this course, once we get into about week four, we're done talking about chemistry, biochemistry, and histology, and cell biology, and we start talking about just the organ systems for the rest of the course. So I think you'll find that easier to memorize than the chemistry. So bear in mind that most of this course will be talking about the organ systems. Okay, so here we have a, a layer of tissue. These little purple spots are all cells, right? So this happens to be a layer of the inner uh, intestine. Right. So the human body is generally studied according to organ systems, right? So here we have the circulatory system, the nervous system, the respiratory system, the digestive system. Collectively, the bones and the muscles are sometimes referred to as, as the mus as musculoskeletal system. All right, so let's talk a little bit about the natural sciences. The natural sciences refer to the physical, sci physical sciences like chemistry, geography, physics, and so on, and biology, and astronomy. Uh, natural si those are classified as natural sciences, right? And then there are other sciences like psychology is a science, a, a slightly different type of science. It's not considered to be a natural science. Uh, psychology, anthropology, sociology are are, are sciences, but they're not considered to be natural sciences. They're basically sciences of studying human behavior. All right, so within the life sciences, the life sciences are all of the subdisciplines of biology. So you've heard the term life sciences before, right? So life sciences include botany, that's the study of plants. Zoology t uh, is, is the study of animals. Taxonomy is a branch of zoology and botany where you classify animals or plants based on common features. Phylogeny is a study of plants or animals where you group them together into specific groups based on a common common ancestors and evolution. Evolution, of course, is a theory that, you, that, that more advanced organisms have advanced from more primitive organisms, and we will talk a little bit about that, but not much. Genetics is a very important subdiscipline of biology, of course. The genes control how the body develops and how it functions. Biochemistry is studying the chemical reactions of the human body. 
we're not finished yet. Molecular biology is a life science that deals with the DNA. Right? Anatomy is the a life science that deals with naming all of the structures and understanding all of the structures of the human body. Physiology is the science of understanding how all of those structures work to sustain life. So you, it's not enough to know what all the parts of the body are named. You also have to know how they work to sustain life. Medicine is what you do when the body breaks down and you want to fix it. Right? Pathology is a branch of medicine, which we will talk a little bit later about pathology. The word pathos, pathos is a Greek word meaning suffering. Logi means to study. So pathology is a pathology. Pathology is a branch of medicine which deals with studying diseases. Right? So if you become a medical doctor, there are a number of uh, sub-disciplines that you can go into. You can be a family practitioner. You can be a cardiologist. That's somebody who specializes in the heart. You can be a neuroscient, you can be a, a neurosurgeon, somebody who specializes doing surgery on the brain, for instance, or you can be a pathologist who is somebody who spends a lot of their time doing research. They are a medical doctor, but they spend a lot of their time doing research into into the mechanisms of disease and how, how things that make us sick, how they actually work. Okay, microbiology, of course, is the study of microscopic organisms. Parasitology is the study of specific microbes that make us sick. Uh, usually, it, it's, it's the study of uh, pathogenic protists. So the protists that make us sick, studying protists that make us sick is commonly a discipline commonly called parasitology. Ecology is the study of when you study an environment, you look at all the animals and all the plants and all the elements that are in that environment and you see how they all interact with each other, right? So who eats whom, which uh, plants take over under these conditions versus other conditions. That's called, that's all called ecology and it's very fascinating. Okay, so now if you just focus on human biology, we have human anatomy, human physiology, human biochemistry, human medicine, and human pathology. So those are sub-disciplines, even smaller, narrower sub-disciplines of biology. All right, so now I just want to explain about how biology fits into the rest of the world. All right, so there are two different types of sciences. One is called basic science, and Scientists who study basic science are simply doing research to find out how the universe works. They're trying to find out how things work. That's a slightly different profession and a slightly different academic discipline than applied science. So applied science is where you take what the basic scientists learned and you apply it to some problem. Uh, maybe you build something and you sell it to people. That's applied science. It's, it's a branch of engineering. So applied science, engineering, is also known as applied science. This is where somebody else does research to figure out how the universe works. And then once they've done that, then you take that information and you use it to manipulate the universe. That's the difference between basic science and applied science. Right? So there are basic scientists in the world and there are applied scientists. Okay, so basic research is basic science. This is finding out how the world works for its own sake, just so that we know. Applied research is where you find out how things work because you want to do something specific. You want to build a machine, you want to invent a drug. Applied research. There is a third branch of this that's referred to as translational research. This is a relatively new profession in biology, but translational research means you're somebody who specializes in figuring out how to convert basic research into applied research, right? So you're one of the, you're one of those people who watches what the what the basic scientists are doing and then says, okay, now uh, you you know you you discovered a bunch of things, but they're not very much use, but they might be more useful if we kind of looked in this area or looked in that other area and then the people who do biotechnology research could make more use of it could make better use of it All right so there's that's that's referred to as translational research okay so nuclear physics uh, uh, somebody who's doing basic nuclear physics is just understanding how atoms work for instance unfortunately this was one of the first applications of nuclear physics uh, but there are better examples this is another example. So we have nuclear power because basic scientists figured out how the atoms work and then applied scientists figure out, figured out how you could generate energy from the release of power from, from uh, decaying atoms. What about biology? We have 
we have applied science scientists and biology too. They're doing something known as biotechnology, bio and then technology. So here we have a piece of moldy bread, right? And I'm sure that many of you realize that mold, certain molds release chemicals that will kill bacteria. And there are many bacteria that make us sick. And so some very clever scientist, actually he wasn't that clever, but his name was Alexander Fleming, by accident discovered that a certain type of fungus secretes a certain chemical that kills deadly bacteria, but it doesn't harm humans, right? So humans, before the invention of antibiotics by Alexander Fleming, humans often got killed by simple bacterial infections. You never hear of anyone well, you, re you do, but you rarely hear of people dying of bacterial infections anymore because we have antibiotics. Somebody invented a whole lot of different types of antibiotics over the years. Right, so Fleming extracted the active compound from these fungi and created penicillin. So penicillin is an antibiotic that was originally derived from a fungus. Its purpose is to kill bacteria. So, so we studied bacteria some uh, you know basic scientists studied bacteria and some other scientists studied fungi and some translational research people put the two ideas together and said hey we can use something that we get from these this these fungi to kill those bacteria right so that's an example of biotechnology okay so biology research translational research Biotechnology is the applications of biology to medicine and commerce and so on. Uh, another classic example, another very good example, are genetically modified plants, which are also known as genetically modified organisms. Genetically modified organisms are where we take a gene from one plant or one animal and we put it into another animal or another plant in order to give it some quality that it didn't have before. And this is done using completely artificial means. So uh, 30 or 40 years ago, this was very controversial uh, to do this. Now we do it all the time. There's probably no way to stop it at this point. You've heard that expression, you can't put the genie back in the bottle. You, have, you find a, a, a bottle with a genie in it, you pop the cork out and you find that the, the genie is a magical creature, but it's, a, it's, it's an evil one, right? You can't put it back. Uh, so the the, the, the science of putting, of putting foreign genes into different organisms to create genetically modified organisms, that's a genie that's out of the bottle. We can't put it back. All we can do is try to pass laws and, 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 and regulate the use of this technology so that it doesn't destroy us. You know, it, it, it could theoretically, but it's probably not going to. But we have to be very careful how we use this technology. So I'll give you some examples of biotechnology applied to genetically modified organisms. All right, this is corn. Corn is frequently, corn crops are frequently destroyed by insects. So there is a company, there's a famous biotechnology company in the, in the United States called Monsanto. Monsanto took a gene from another organism that that uh, insects don't like to eat and they put it into the corn so that the insects don't like to eat it and humans can't taste the difference. So this is an advantage because it kill, you know, the insects won't eat it and you don't need to spray the corn with pesticides anymore. Right? So that's an example. Monsanto is one of the is one of the world's most famous uh, genetic uh, most famous producers of genetically modified plants. Okay? So that probably the corn that you eat is genetically modified. You may also be interested to know that if you eat yellow corn, it was genetically modified already. And it wasn't, the only difference is that it, Monsanto modified the corn artificially by putting together a gene that would never otherwise get into the corn. But the corn that you eat, that we all eat, the yellow corn is actually a mutant form. Uh, wild type corn that has no mutations is, not, is naturally not yellow, it's purple like this, right? So naturally occurring corn is purple. The corn that we eat is yellow because it has a mutation and we've just gotten used to eating the mutant variety of corn. The mutation happened millions of years, or not millions, but thousands of years ago. So it's not like something happened recently. Okay, so corn is more, more correctly known as maize and maize was made by the Mesoamerican Indians who took various <clears throat> Mesoamerican Indians like the like the Olmec and the Aztec who live in Central America between between Mexico and Brazil in Central America and those those 
meso means the middle and then america right so in the middle of Amer in between north and south america you have meso america and so the Mesoamerican Indians thousands of years ago invented corn by crossing together different breeds of grasses until they got the corn. It was very, actually one of the most amazing feats of human genetic engineering was done by the Mesoamerican Indians who did this. Uh, it took many years, and uh, but they invented maize and then, they, then the Europeans brought it back to Europe and the North Americans took it to North America and so we grow lots of it. It's, it's mostly starch. The corn kernels are mostly starch, but the original maize was purple, and then the form that we eat today is yellow. Okay, here's something that's a little bit more sinister. If you grow tomatoes, you know that tomatoes are very sensitive to a sudden cold snap. In fact, people usually grow tomatoes in a greenhouse because if there's a sudden drop in temperature, if, if the temperature drops below freezing suddenly, uh, you know, depending on how much light you have in the area that you're trying to grow tomatoes, the, tr the tomatoes are only starting to ripen as winter approaches and you're always in danger of having the temperature drop below zero and ruining all your tomatoes. Even if the temperature drops below zero for one day or for one night, you'll ruin the tomatoes. Right. Now over here, we have a fish that lives in the Arctic. Now the fish lives in water that has a below zero, where the temperature of the water is below zero. Why doesn't the water freeze? I mean, water is supposed to freeze at zero, but in fact, it's only pure water that freezes at a temperature of zero, right? So, so water freezes at, pure water freezes at zero, salt water, a solution can be at a, can freeze at a lower temperature. And so the water in the Arctic is actually below zero. Right, so there are some Arctic fish that live in that water below zero. Why doesn't their blood freeze? Why doesn't the fish freeze? And the reason for that is because the fish have a special, they have a gene that produces a special protein that, produce, that, that goes into the blood and prevents ice crystals from forming. And many biotechnology companies have taken that gene out of the fish and put it into the tomato. Right, so we have tomatoes, we now have tomatoes that have a fish protein inside them. Uh, they have a fish gene that's producing a fish protein, except it's not really a fish protein if it's being produced inside a tomato, is it? But the gene originally came from the fish. And they have the same thing with some oranges, where oranges are sensitive to sudden cold snaps. One day, the temperature goes below zero, the oranges are ruined, the next day the temperature goes back up and a, a farmer loses their entire crop because one day cold. There's a way to prevent that. You put the antifreeze fish, fish gene into the genome, the, gene, the set of genes that this orange has. Right, so that's another example of biotechnology. All right, so now let's ask the question, who pays biologists, right? So you know me, I'm a biologist and I'm paid by Columbia College to teach biology. So there are teachers. In addition to that, biologists have jobs at universities and they are doing basic research for the university. So there are lots of those, lots of biologists that are employed by colleges like Columbia to teach biology. There are lots of biologists that are employed by universities like the University of British Columbia, UBC or Simon Fraser University or University of Fraser Valley to do research in biology. And the government, the Canadian government and other governments around the world also employ biologists to keep track of how many fish are left, keep track of how many insects are attacking our farms and our wheat, uh, how many insects, how many animals are on the verge of extinction. The government employs lots of biologists, right? But so do private companies. Now, one of the, one of the main differences between university and government biologists versus private company biologists is that usually the private company biologists work on things like vaccines and pharmaceuticals, that means drugs and other technologies, and they are usually required to keep, the, keep what they discover a secret so that other companies can't replicate what they've done. Uh, now, you can't keep that kind of thing a secret forever. Lots of companies can reverse engineer what you've discovered, and that's why we have patents. A patent is a legal agreement that says whichever company put up all the money, invested all the money to invent this thing deserves to be rewarded. Uh, otherwise, there would be no pharmaceuticals. I mean, why would somebody invest 
billions of dollars into inventing a new drug. If you sell one bottle of that drug and another company takes the pill and reverse engineers it, they put it in a they put it in a chemical spectrograph and they figure out what's in it and they build the same thing and then you're out of business because they can sell it for a lot less. They didn't have to invest in the research. So that's why we have the patent system. Uh, the uh, the patent, patenting inventions is a little bit controversial, but I think that we've done much better as a society if we allow uh, inventors to patent their inventions and sell them exclusively for a limited period of time so that they can recover their investment. So uh, one of the main differences between private company biologists and government biologists that work for universities and so on is that the ones that work for the government and, and the universities are required to tell everyone about their research and to tell everybody what they've discovered and they share the information with the public versus the ones who work for private companies who have to keep it a secret. Okay, finally, before we leave this lecture, we're almost at the end. I just wanted to return to the idea that biology is a science at heart. Some of it is main, some of biology is strictly, uh, you know, it's strictly uh, observational, but you just observe things. But a lot of biology is experimental. Okay, so the scientific method is a way of figuring out how the universe works that involves experiments. Okay, a systematic way of understanding how the universe works through experimentation. So before we invented the scientific method, we used to use intuition or observation combined and sort of make guesses and, in, and inferences about how the universe works. For example, there was an ancient belief that, you know, the ancient, very ancient Greeks used to believe that only round things would burn, right? And they did this through observation and anecdote and so on, all right? So we all know that logs burn. You can make a fire with logs, right? You can make a fire and straw burns. And they believed anything that was long and thin would burn, okay? And then you'd say, well, here's a marble pedestal. Why doesn't that burn? And they would say, well, that's an exception. Right. Okay, well, what about this oil lamp? You put oil in the lamp, and then the then you would say, yeah, but what shape is oil? And you'd say, well, oil has no shape. You say, but if you pour it into a long, thin container, it is long and thin. So that's that. You know, we're we're struggling to keep our theory going. But they did have the theory that only things that are round burn. And you say, okay, well, if you cut the if you cut some logs into square into square boards, they still burn. But yeah, but they were they were originally long and thin and round. Uh, anyway, if they just done some experiments, they probably if they done more experiments, which we did do eventually, we figured out that there's there's a whole entirely different reason why things burn, and they discovered why things burn through experimentation. All right, so the scientific method uses experimentation to gather hard evidence. You start by forming a hypothesis. This is basically a theory that you come up with based on your observations and your intuition. And then you do experiments to either confirm or reject your hypothesis. And so you do experiments, you get results, and you reach conclusions, and you say that either your hypothesis was correct or it was wrong. If it was wrong, you go back to the drawing board and you think some more, and then you do some more experiments. Right. So the cornerstone of the scientific method is that you have to do experiments. All right, now the scientific method also uses skepticism. Skepticism means the other scientist, you have to do experiments and invent things and discover things, and then you have to tell all, your, all of your scientist friends about it, and they are going to be skeptical that you really did discover something. Right? So generally what the sci scientific method also does is see when when we, uh, whenever somebody tries to tell us, I know how the universe works because I saw this happen. In the old days, we used to say, well, we'll take your word for it. But we have advanced much more in science and technology and civilization. We have advanced much faster in the last thousand years because we've started with the attitude that if you tell me something, I am not going to believe you unless you prove it. Right, so if you tell me the universe works a certain way, I'm not going to believe you unless you can prove it with evidence, with experimental evidence. And once you've done the experiments and shown me the results, I have to be able to do the same experiments and get the same results as you did. If we can do that, then then maybe I believe you. Right, so this is called this is called the peer review process. You've heard of the cardinal principle that uh, in law, when we're trying to put criminals behind bars, we have to prove that they were criminals first with evidence, with real solid hard evidence. 
And the presumption is that you are innocent unless you are proven guilty by evidence. Well, we have the same thing in science and it's something called the null hypothesis. Right, so in law, you have to prove that somebody is guilty by going through a lengthy legal process. In science, you have to prove that your theory or your hypothesis is correct by doing experiments. And we start out with the skeptical viewpoint that you didn't prove what you said you were trying to prove. That is referred to as the null hypothesis. And then if you actually succeed in presenting hard evidence beyond a critical threshold, then we do something called rejecting the null hypothesis and accepting the fact that you proved what you meant to prove, right? So in law, we say guilty until proven innocent. In science, we say we have the null hypothesis. So when another scientist is doing experiments, their, the, their evidence that they uncover to prove their hypothesis has to reach to a certain level of significance before, uh, before uh, we actually believe you. So that's called you accept or you reject the null hypothesis in science. And then finally, other scientists have to replicate your experimental results. They have to be able to somebody, you know, one experiment could be a fluke, right? So other people all over the world have to try and repeat the experiment you did exactly the same way. And if they don't get the same results, then you did something wrong or they did, but you have to keep on looking. So this is referred to as the peer review process. And if you're a public scientist working at a university or for the government, you have to publish your experiments in what are called scientific journals, publications, right? So you've heard that, probably heard the term publish or perish. This is true if you're an academic, you have to publish experiments and findings in scientific journals or you will not get to keep your job at the university. The peer review process, right? Publish or perish. These are all scientific journals that you might've heard of. Here's the New England Journal of Medicine. Here's the journal Science. Here's the journal Nature. This is the journal Cell. These are the most important Science, Nature, Cell, uh, New England Journal of Medicine. PNAS stands for Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences. These are the most important journals that a scientist can publish their results in so that other scientists can then look at their results and then try and repeat them, all right? So that is part of the peer review process that science operates with. All right, so that is that concludes my introductory, introductory lecture just on basically introducing you to what biology is. Next, next lecture is about elementary chemistry. It may be a little bit difficult for some of you, but we're not going to learn a lot of chemistry. And if, if you're unable to learn the chemistry, you won't, you won't lose a lot of marks because not much of the course is based on chemistry. Uh, probably about 5% or 10% of your marks mark will be determined by chemistry. But now I'm going to go through the syllabus just so that we can see where we're going for the rest of the semester. Okay, so the first lecture is an introduction to biology, which you've just had. Then we're going to do a very brief introduction to chemistry. Then we're going to do a brief introduction to macromolecules and then an introduction to the structure and the organelles that you find inside cells. We're going to learn a little bit about the cell membrane, which surrounds the cell right? Kind of the shell of a cell. Then we're going to learn about what happens when you take a whole bunch of cells that are, that are specialized to do the same thing and make them into a layer of tissue. The study of tissues is called histology. And then we're going to get into what you might recognize more easily as being human biology. We're going to, just, we're going to study the bones. That's the skeletal system. We're going to study the digestive system. We're going to study the endocrine system, which is the uh, production of hormones. Hormones control the development and, and uh, various other characteristic, characteristics of the body. So you've probably heard about the thyroid hormone and the pituitary gland and, and the adrenal glands. Those are all part of a system of organs that produce hormones that's called, this system is called the endocrine system. The musculoskeletal system, we'll talk about the muscles that pull and push, actually pull, the bones around. So the, the muscles make the bones move, right? So we'll talk about the muscular system and the skeletal system. We'll talk about the human respiratory system, which is used for breathing the air. We'll talk about the circulatory system, which is the heart and the blood vessels that circulate the blood. We'll talk about the renal system. The renal system refers to the kidneys. And part of the function of the kidneys is to filter urea out of the blood and also to maintain the proper fluid balance in the body, which is something called osmoregulation. 
we will talk about the immune system. This is the white blood cells and the other organs that, that kill foreign invading organisms, protists and bacteria that get into our body, the immune system. They also kill, the immune system also kills cancer cells when it can so on. We'll talk about the human reproductive system and we'll talk about the human nervous system which includes the the brain and the spinal cord and the peripheral nerves. Right? So the so as soon as we get through chemistry, macromolecules and cell biology, we'll move into histology and from then on everything I talk about will be easily recognizable as human biology. Thank you very much and I hope to see you in the next lecture which I will make available very soon.